Welcome back to the Exile Club. I'm Jacobite here with Derek up north, and we are on the journey of One Piece. And today we're going to be talking about Orange Town. Derek, are you excited for this second arc that we're going to be exploring? Dude, I'm so excited to talk to you about Orange Town. I know last week we had a lot of fun with Romance Dawn. We met a lot of characters like Zoro, Kobe, Axe Hand, Morgan, and obviously Monkey D. Luffy, huge favorite right out of the gate. Um, but Orange Town, definitely one of the things I noticed, takes a more serious approach to the story. We start to see a lot of new characters, uh, including another character finally that has another devil fruit power. So that... That was really cool, and I am really excited to just sit down and, and get your thoughts on, on this arc as we continue our journey through One Piece. No, I'm really excited about this uh, arc. It's obviously introduced, like you said, so many more characters that we are going to be meeting and being introduced to and getting to know a little bit more. Um, the one thing that I've really been enjoying is just seeing how different this is to the live action right obviously the live action is the the base of it all and how it all starts and how the crew assembles right and i'm really enjoying how in depth the anime gets with introducing the characters and where they come from and how they meet and their interactions with luffy um so this one we do get to see nami you know and and it goes into a little bit more detail on how they meet for sure i mean one of the things that i noticed right out of the gate i mean obviously as we continue through every episode of the anime we're going to be comparing it to the live action series because that's what we started with we both started watching the live action series before we ever dived into the anime and so i think for both of us the the live action sorry is is the bar um whereas i think a lot of people are looking at it through a different lens where they're going you know i've been watching the anime for years and now the live action series has come out. I'm I'm looking at the anime being the bar. So if they can't if they can't do the anime justice, you know I don't want to watch the live action. Where it, you know obviously it's the reverse for us. But with all that being said, there was some huge differences between how Orange Town is presented in the live action series and just in the anime itself. Right? We saw different fights, different characters, characters that didn't even appear in the live action series. We saw characters like Shushu, uh, the dog in the anime, huge, sad story about the owner leaving. And then of course, passing away. And, uh, and then some of Buggy's guys come and basically destroy the pet shop. We saw a, a completely different interaction between Nami and Luffy in the anime and how they meet. And, which is a lot of fun because you get to see their character development, I think, in a different light. So that was really great because their exchange between each other when they're hiding from Buggy and all of his men was fantastic. But then we also see that even when they confront Buggy, it's a completely different layout. It's it's totally different. Where in the live action, they're inside, you know, like a circus tent and Luffy's trapped in a water tank. In the anime, we see Luffy basically being a prisoner in a cage and Nami wants to join Buggy's crew. Like there was a lot of mind games and manipulation within this arc and a lot of, a lot of extra fighting that we didn't get to see at least on the same scale in the live action series. So this was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed this story. No, and I really enjoy the interaction that uh, Luffy and Nami get into right off the bat it really shows who Nami is in the show at, at first and where she comes from. You know, she's a thief, you know, and she'll do anything she can to steal what she needs. And uh, obviously we see in the arc that she's got goals. She's got goals that she needs and wants to meet for certain things that she needs to do. So when they first meet, you know, it's very conniving and uh basically throws luffy under the bus and uh one she lets these goons try to beat the shit out of him and uh he kicks their ass and she's shocked as hell the the interaction between luffy and and nami is great i mean obviously we we get to see her conniving side we get to see the part where she is 
definitely very manipulative but we get a taste of that at the beginning of like orange town when you start the arc because you you remember when you first meet her she's out on the boat right like she's just she's hanging out there she's playing like a damsel in distress you think that there's something wrong uh and then some of buggy's guys they, they come up on her and they think oh man we're gonna take advantage of this so we're gonna steal everything that she has right and uh nope she dupes them right so she's like no they're trying to they're trying to steal all her treasure and then she hijacks their ship gets out of there which is great because right off the hop you get an idea that this woman is willing to do whatever whatever it takes to achieve her goals like you said so when she does meet luffy and she has that interaction in that fight where she just allows luffy to basically contend with these guys to see basically she doesn't want to be a part of this this fight and luffy ends up taking them all down it's it's a little bit manipulative and and then once again you know they retreat they are hiding away from buggy's men and they're in the bar and you think you think maybe there's an opportunity there that these two are going to come together and work together because even though they are not necessarily aligning in their goals because luffy wants to be king of the pirates he wants to add someone to his pirate crew nami doesn't want to work with the pirates she says she hates pirates and realistically she's just a pirate thief you think these two are going to come together but they don't now at least not in the way that we wanted to see it happen because she ends up manipulating luffy by basically tying him up and taking him as a prisoner so he can be the fall guy for her stealing the map from buggy it was an incredibly good insight into the way that nami's mind kind of thinks i i find it kind of cool that uh in the anime the map that nami's trying to steal is the map that luffy needs and in the and that map is with buggy and in the live action is with Axhand Morgan. I honestly think by them having Axhand Morgan be the one that has the map was just to give him a little bit more importance in the live action because really he's just a blip on the radar as far as the anime went or even in the manga. Like he's a cool character. He looks really badass, especially in the anime. I thought he looked way more impressive in the anime. And we talked a little bit about that, but I think they just because they needed to fill some screen time in the live action series it's just easier give him the map give him some relevance to you know move the story along rather than wait because they i think they really wanted to reveal buggy in a big way for the live action series whereas i mean you do get that that notion in the anime that when you meet buggy this is a this is an important character because he's an he's like the first actual pirate outside of alvida that he's about to face and and then you get thrown that curveball that the buggy's not just any pirate he's he's also someone who has eaten a devil fruit and we haven't really crossed that line yet we knew that luffy ate the gum gum fruit and now we learn that buggy has eaten the chop chop fruit so that really set everything up in like perfect motion in terms of success for buggy's character in both series because it was kind of like a, a mic drop right um and it was definitely one of the one of the events that really set in my mind when i think about orange town i i go back constantly to zoro confronting buggy and being incredibly confident that he's just gonna beat him no problem um because, I mean, clearly he's got this reputation in the East Blue as a great swordsman. Maybe not the greatest, but he is great and he is feared. And, yeah, he chops up Buggy, but Buggy Buggy puts himself back together again. And you're not expecting that. And I thought that was really cool. So the way that they've introduced characters like Nami, Buggy, uh, and really kind of like giving you a different insight into the way that they, they work within the universe, outside of what we already knew watching the live action was a lot of fun while we're talking about nami was there a specific moment at all throughout the arc that stood out to you where you were like oh fuck i love this character uh there is a moment where i do fall for the nami character and that's when she shows her vulnerability a little bit when 
he's got that cannon aimed right at Luffy, and he asks Nami to light it, to light the wick to uh, to blow up Luffy. And uh, she acts like she wants to, but she there's something in the back of her head that says this is not right. This is not right. I can't do this. Now, this all could just lead down to either Luffy's just a really nice guy and she doesn't want to kill him or she can only as a thief can only go so far. I mean, I feel like there is a limit to who she is and how far she can go as a thief. Also, the fact that she isn't necessarily really a bad guy and doesn't really want to become what we've already seen as what villains consist of. So when she th showed that vulnerability at that moment where she was stumbling on it at a decision, I really, I really kind of felt for her. You know what I mean? Because, you know, she's going against the grain here. She's going against what she's used to. She's used to the conniving. She's used to the thieving. She's used to throwing people under the bus. And at this one moment, she's sort of getting a change of heart here. And uh, and I feel like this is this is it may be just a simple moral thing but for me it, i feel like it's a luffy thing right it's a luffy thing there's something about luffy that attracts these people to him you know what i mean it could be anybody but again we're talking about the crew that he's collecting along the way and there's something about luffy that they just don't necessarily think he should die <laughs> and then that's a good thing that's a good thing um, but yeah, that's that's my feelings about that one part. And she ends up not being able to do it. So we all know where kind of, she kind of leads there until Zoro comes in and saves the day. Yeah, I mean, that was an incredible scene too, like to touch on that a little bit. I mean, I, I really enjoyed that, that whole, just that in-depth look uh, into her humanity. Because like you said, you know, like she's a pirate thief, but like, where's the line, right? She, I don't, I don't think at this point she's killed anybody in the past. And now she's like, now she's slated with this, this thought of like, oh, I have, I have to kill somebody. So I'm not sure like if it was, if it was a Luffy thing, I, I can, I can see where you're going with that train of thought because Luffy does this, does have this way of like attracting people towards him. He's just got good energy. Right. And, um, and you can tell like, he's not a typical pirate. He says he's a pirate, but he doesn't really fit the idea of what a pirate should be. So, but I, but I actually think that the reason she didn't want to do it was because she didn't want to she didn't want to become what she hated she didn't want to be like a pirate right she uh and i think she actually even said something similar to that or something along those lines where she was like if, if i do this am i basically just as bad as they are and i mean in some cases that would be correct um so the fact that she showed any level of restraint and decided not to kill Luffy in that moment. I mean, she could have. She could have killed him, and she could have continued on with her whole idea of, you know, stealing from Buggy and then getting the hell out of there. Um, but she chose not to do that because the humanity in her just wouldn't allow it to happen. And I thought that was really cool as well because it just, it makes you connect to that character on an emotional level. And, and you don't expect that to happen in a cartoon or in an anime or literally most media. So it was really neat to see and, and how they were able to convey those emotions just in her, like, what, if it was like a short interaction, right? But then another really great moment is, you know, like you had mentioned, Zoro comes in, saves the day, and he confronts Buggy. And we kind of touched on that earlier. You know, he he's confident that he's going to be able to defeat Buggy. Buggy is confident that he can defeat Zoro. And uh, so the interaction between those two is kind of fun because it really shows you the gravity of just how um, powerful Zoro's reputation in the East Blue is. Everyone seems to know him. And the people that do know him want to kill him because they know it's going to give them some level of renown, right? So watching those two kind of go at it was was a lot of fun. Probably easily one of my favorite fight scenes in the entire uh, arc of Orange Town. No, and again, we see this moment where Zoro, the one with huge confidence and wants his main goal is to be the best swordsman, um go up against buggy and again we're seeing now buggy's true form 
with this fruit, devil's fruit, um, that he's eaten where he can dismember himself and control those pieces uh, in any way, form he, he wants to. And yeah, this is super cool. I mean, again, it would be really cool to have it. I mean, in cartoon, it looks cool. In, in, in live action, it wasn't as gruesome as it would be in my mind if we had that in real life <laughs> it's like uh, a little dismemberment uh it would it'd be a bit bloody um but i think it's 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 uh it's again the devil's fruit is the downfall for this battle here and uh it, it gets the best of zoro not expecting at all that uh buggy has this ability um, which then Zoro gets stabbed and it kind of weakens him a little bit and uh, he's in shock that uh, this would happen. Um, but at the end of the day, they have to save the day. And uh, so they find a way to get out of it. And uh, this is where Zoro is still capable of saving or being the hero here and uh, making the quick decision to turn the cannon around and uh, blow the shit out of uh, Buggy and his crew, and they escape, which is, I think, a perfect scenario. Oh, it was pretty awesome, too, because, like, Zoro, in that fight with Buggy, I mean, he gets cut right in the midsection, right? Like, it's a, it's a big wound, and you can see he's hurt. He gets stabbed from behind, I believe, um, because he doesn't know about the Chop Chop fruit yet, or that Buggy has eaten it, and he doesn't know about this power until, you know, he's got a, a knife in him. And, uh, and then, yeah, after he flips the cannon, I mean, the guy's wounded and he still manages to, to grab Luffy's cage and basically drag him to freedom, um, or at least for a minute to get a little bit of a separation between them, uh, which was really awesome. And it kind of shows the, the level of like allegiance or loyalty that Zoro has to just Luffy and in protecting his life. So that was really fun. I like, I love Honestly, anytime that I get to see Zoro on screen, I'm like just kind of glued because his character to me has been so far the most interesting character. But I want to talk a little bit about Buggy for a second because honestly, like, dude, the dude has the Chop Chop fruit. So that's only the second devil fruit that we've seen. And it's kind of a neat power. Do you, okay, like for real, real talk is, can he, can he separate any body part i mean i hope so like like any body part do you think like like obviously we see his hands his head his feet and all the stuff because we saw it live action we saw it in the anime but like i'm talking about like you know the 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 the, cl the clown bits you know can he separate that too the clown bits i mean if he could i would <laughs> see and like i don't know it was it just me or anybody else thinking that like were you thinking that like okay the dude can separate himself is he like can can he do that i think we're the only ones that w that are wondering if he can do that yeah that's probably true i think we need to get yeah we're a bit fucking twisted hey look you eat a devil's fruit that makes you dismember pieces of your body i mean trust me you might think about it well, he, the, the whole thing is, is think about it. At the end of the day, if you, if you eat an, a devil's fruit, you're telling me that if you weren't a rubber man or had the ability to like chop your body into different pieces, you wouldn't, you know, try to really test the limits of whether or not, you know, everything is rubber or if everything can separate. I totally would. Absolutely. I mean, you're living with this power for the rest of your life. So, I mean, if you're not thinking about it now, you're thinking about it down the road. There's going to be a time where it might be necessary to use. Right? I mean, there's going to be times where scenarios are going to come and you're going to think, hey, I mean, this is the moment. Uh, I've never tried this before, but uh, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> now, that could go many different ways. I mean, uh, take it as you want. I think you would have to if you chop chopped any specific body parts. Yeah, well, I mean the uh, the options are endless. Oh, absolutely.
So like I had mentioned, in Orangetown, we meet a lot of different characters. Um, but what was your favorite, like, side character that you got introduced to in Orangetown? Because there was a few of them. Well, there definitely was a few of them. Um, a little too many. But that there was enough that I could pick out one of my favorites. Um, and it was Kabaji. Kabaji? Uh, yeah. I think Kabaji was really cool. Dude was on a unicycle. Yeah, he was on a unicycle. And uh, we see a little bit of him in the live action, but not a lot whatsoever. Yeah. Um, but in the anime, we see what he's capable of and why he's Buggy's right-hand man. The guy pulls out the circus act with the unicycle yeah <laughs> and the swords and uh and i think this is again one of my favorite battles when it comes down to zoro and kabaji i think the battle was really really cool to get into and i'm glad they showed us um but it just showed you the skill and power that kabaji had and uh and the smartness against zoro now Zoro and him, they f they went at it. Yeah, and we haven't really seen anyone go toe to toe with Zoro yet. No, especially with their both similar uh, sets of skills. Yeah. And again, here is the moment where Zoro he's obligated to to face Kabaji as they're both swordsmen, and this is. This is Zoro's goal, right? To be the best swordsman in in uh, in One Piece, you know, the whole damn show. And uh, it, it's he struggled, you know. There, there was a, there was a moment of weakness again, where it just shows you. And this has nothing to do with how weak Zoro can be. This is just a and an, it's it's an, almost an endurance thing, a, 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 like a, a comeback story for Zoro every time he gets hurt or gets down there's always he comes back from it and 10 times smarter and stronger right so we see that he gets he had been stabbed earlier and midway through this fight he uses that 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 injury as an advantage to mess with Kabaji's head basically saying you can hurt me, but you can't beat me. As I'm, I'm already hurt, and I'm still going to fight you. And he gets back up and he wins. But the whole battle, just between the back and forthness of them both, I think was just really fucking epic as fuck. Yeah, I really, I really like the the unicycle as well. Like the dude's on a unicycle and he's he's a sword fighter. Like I, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite at that caliber. <laughs> no. But it, yeah, again, to your point, like it was, you know, it's like a little bit of a, it shows the strength of Zoro in a fight. I mean, the guy's hurt and, and here he is, he's got an actual real threat up against him. Like, I mean, he just went toe to toe with, with Buggy. However, it, that was not, in my opinion, like a fair fight. Buggy obviously stabs him in the back. Right. So for sure, this is like head on with Kabaji these two are, are fighting each other and Kabaji's out to make a point right if he can take down Zoro this that's a, that's a big deal in, in universe uh, as far as the East Blue goes so I I thoroughly enjoyed this the sequence but the side character that stood out for me the most is one that you're probably going to shake your head at me for um but it's it's Shushu I'm team Shushu stupid dog <laughs> Yeah, no, and and it, it it's it's a cute moment. It's a cute moment. It's 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 a heartfelt moment, and and I totally get why you're uh, why you bring it up um, because it's it's a it's a moment of devastation of where Orange Town has gotten, right? And it's 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 one of those core members of that community that has been affected of Buggy's destruction, and. It's just, yeah, I mean, pets, humans, I mean, I mean, gotta love pets, right? I mean, it's, it, it's easy to basically fall in love or connect with a human character in any TV show, but Shushu stood out to me because 
not only was this a cool character because it's a dog, <laughs> but the thing that stood out to me was the fact that Shu Shu's whole story really sets up the entire theme for the entire arc, right? Shu Shu is this dog who had an owner that owned a pet shop. And when we meet Shu Shu, he's protecting the pet shop. I mean, and this is like a small little dog. He he can barely do anything, or at least as far as I would imagine. And the owner dies. And now Shu Shu is standing guard for all these years because he doesn't know what else to do. He still has hope that his owner will return, but he's protecting his treasure. And we see that theme all throughout the entire arc. We see that with Buggy, with his map. We see that with uh, Luffy and his hat when it gets destroyed or wrecked by a Buggy uh, closer to the end of the arc. We see that come up multiple times throughout the story. And it was really just interesting to me because it allows you some insight and really all because this dog and it and his little side story so um that was the side character that stood out the most to me but i guess if i had to pick another side character i really dug the mayor man the mayor was cool look like the guy has no business fighting like someone like buggy or a pirate or anybody for that matter because he's this old dude but he's tough as nails man or at least he's brave enough and has the balls to confront people to protect his town i thought that was actually really cool what'd you think about that no i mean i, I think the best moment when uh about the mayor was when he got knocked out just knocks him the fuck out and says nah I, I'm, I'm here to help you by knocking you out because you're gonna get yourself killed and uh i th i just think that was also a funny moment um when it comes because i mean he's an old stubborn man who wanted to defend his town but you know didn't know what was good for him when it comes down to it you know the the the, the stubbornness could have got him killed but uh just the way luffy handled it i thought was pretty funny because i mean again you know you don't expect the you don't expect that level of ruthlessness from luffy you know he's a ruthless like he's got that attitude but when it comes down to that action where it's like, dude, you just knocked out an old man. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't see it coming. You had brought up a point last time we had sat down and talked when we were breaking down Romance Dawn. And you had made a point to kind of talk about um, the difference between Luffy between the live action and the anime. And one of the like stark differences, especially like because you mentioned the mayor and his interaction with him when he knocks him out. L Luffy doesn't, he doesn't care. Like, <laughs> No. Just, yeah, he he's one of those characters that uh, constantly shocks me. He's he seems to just not uh, he just does whatever he wants. Yeah, you know if he thinks it's a good idea, he's going to do it. Uh, there's no rhyme or reason, uh, at least as far as I know. I don't think he has any like pre mental planning. He's just like the mayor's going to die here, so I'll just take him out. And then we we see it in other instances as well. No, and his his, his intentions are, I think, in the right place. It's. It's how he deals with those intentions. And I oh, think absolutely. they're just, they're very spontaneous rather than uh, any well thought out um, ideas. But uh, I think that's what makes him who he is and, and, and why he's funny in, to watch. Because, uh, yeah, he does whatever he wants. And, uh, but again, like I said, it's, I feel like his intentions are there, but his actions are louder. Than, than they than they should be right yeah you never really know what luffy is gonna do next i mean he's pretty like in the live action series he talks a lot because i think he has to drive the series in a in a direction or at least a story in the anime i mean obviously he's the main character he's the one that everyone's going to be rooting for but he seems a lot more reserved he's a little bit more quiet and he's very off the cuff and it shows not just in what he says when he says things to different characters that he meets but he also you see it through his actions right so i i always thought that was kind of funny but he, he i don't know if you noticed but he also has a bit of a short fuse like he's he's easy to get like bent out of shape i mean like when he when buggy actually does some damage to his straw hat holy crap it's like a light switch has just been turned on and he turns into a totally different person just rage filled 
Yeah, and I think we get to see that here in this uh, arc is that, you know, you either you fuck with his crew or you fuck with his hat. And then when you when you see those things, it's it's almost like certain sentimental things. If you mess with them, it 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 pisses him off. You know what I mean? And and rightfully so. Rightfully so. So you know what I mean? Like when we saw um, Buggy destroy his hat or at least do some damage with that hat, it does a little flashback on why that hat means so much to him and it was given to him by shanks and 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 shanks i feel like is a big part of who luffy is and why luffy is doing what he's doing you know it was his it was his idol we know we talked about this when we first introduced we got introduced to shanks and he was his idol you know is is all of the above you know what i mean the father figure the pirate figure the the just the the person who luffy looked up to the most right so there was uh shanks always believed in him you know but also kind of wanted to steer him in the right direction at the same time and uh that's why he gets pissed off for sure so it's and, and, and i think anything that luffy loves don't fuck with it don't fuck yeah. with it because you're, you're gonna get a gum gum yeah you're gonna get a gum gum man that's a really great way to sum it up honestly because that's the truth uh and we see that we see that like with his interactions with the people like he clearly cares about people he cares about his hat which is, like you said, because it's tied to Shanks and he holds Shanks in, in such a high regard. The thing that um, that I, I, I've been really enjoying about Luffy's character is, is again, just, just how chill he is for the most, most part. Like, he's he's got his quirks. I mean, the guy likes to eat. We see that all the time. And we know he's super confident that he, he you know, he, he strongly believes that he's going to be the Pirate King. But... The thing that really draws me to Luffy is is his just carefree personality. He's so chill. He's so laid back. Shit's falling apart all around him sometimes, and and he just kind of holds it together, right? Like he's almost like a guiding light in some respects. Because while everybody else is like, "This is bad," he's like, eh, "Whatever," <laughs> and so and uh you know he's facing off against guys like buggy in this one and in this, in this arc and and you know it, that doesn't seem to phase him at all and and it, it's kind of shocking because this is one of those characters where you're like he really has no business being as tough as he is but he's honestly kind of a threat like you would think buggy's the threat but it's really luffy is the threat to buggy right and that's just it, right? He's he is he's dangerous in the mind as well, right? I mean, we we've seen in a few instances where if it's not strength that's needed at that moment, it's the cleverness, right? Is it's that's that was really the only way to take down Buggy in this arc was was the cleverness. It was their smarts, you know. Yeah. How do you how do you destroy a person who can dismember themselves? Yeah, right. Take those pieces away from them. Nami definitely came in clutch and tied yeah, him up and disable those disable those pieces that he dismembers himself with and and even the even through that uh, Kabaji and Zoro fight you know what I mean like uh, Luffy stepped in so it would not be interrupted and Buggy was about to interrupt that fight by dismembering his hand to get behind Zoro and possibly take him down. But uh, Luffy outsmarted him and, and, and stepped on his hand. And that was it. It was a nonchalant, just walked over, stepped on his hand, and did a little giggle and a smile. And, and, and that was it. And that's, that's, that's the funny part of Luffy is, is uh, you're right. Like, there's many instances where it's like, it's, uh, he's just, it, it, he's just happy to be there. <laughs> he's just well you know he, he saw a moment and he took it and it was just a very i think when it comes down to helping his friends and again this comes down to the things he loves it's just he loves doing those things for his friends right and it's just like yeah here i'll help you you know what i mean but not helping him in 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 in, in a way where it's like hey zoro you know you can't win this fight no it's more of a this fight's not getting interrupted here. Um, and buggy, you're a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely an out-of-the-box thinker. And I don't think the people that face off against Luffy really are anticipating that. Of all the years that Buggy was in a fight, do you think he was ever, like, tied up while he was dismembered? I don't think so. 
No, I guess not. I don't think anybody was clever enough to think about that because at the end of the day, I think Buggy would have been prepared for something like that had he experienced it before. But because Luffy is an out of the box, clever thinker, does stuff on the fly, you just don't know what to expect from him. And then that goes with the gum gum uh, moves. All of his gum gum moves, you just never know which one he's going to use. And then he's got like a plethora of them because we saw a ton of these in this arc. I I think we were only, we only saw in the first arc, what was it? Like a gum gum pistol. Yep. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, whatever. Either way, we were limited to what we got to see in the first arc as far as his like abilities go. In this arc, we get to see all different gum gum finisher moves, which are actually kind of fun because again, you never know which one's going to happen next. Yeah, this one we get to see uh gum gum balloon and then gum gum bazooka and gum gum balloon even Nami was was weirded out by that one and it was when he blew up like a balloon and yeah. bounced the the cannon right off his belly and nami was like what are you <laughs> what did you just do and and i don't even think luffy really knows exactly everything he's capable of doing but when it comes down to the moment and this is the funny thing too is it's like is he making up these words as he goes? Like, is he just naming these moves as he goes? Like, I remember in the live action, they said, well, doesn't every... Doesn't every great pirate name their moves or something? Like, I, I don't... I can't remember where I heard that, but I feel like I heard it somewhere in the show. Y- yeah, he says, every great fighter calls out his finishing moves. Right. Right. So it's like, okay, so randomly if he's never done these moves before you know he's just naming naming them off like gum gum balloon and then what finishes off this whole or at least the big impact finisher for against buggy he uses gum gum bazooka yeah i I just think it's super funny how he just he might be just naming these things as he goes (laughs) do you think that in all the years before he like actually became um before we actually get to see him uh, in the first arc, do you think he was like just hanging out on a beach somewhere, testing out his abilities as this rubber man and like deciding then and there what his finishers were going to be, naming them while he was like fighting against or sparring with like a palm tree or something? You know, like how yeah. does he come up with these? Is to your point, is he coming up with them on the fly? Did he spend some time trying to figure them out on his own? Are these premeditated? Be- and like, how many did he come up with that we haven't seen yet? And that's just it, right? How many gum gums does he have, right? And I, again, I think I'm going to stick with it. I don't think he's trained. I don't think he's at all sat around. And this is just my opinion. I, I feel like it's just fucking random, <laughs> but, but again, every, even, even every great wrestler has sat down and, and thought about, you know, what they're going to name their finishers, if they were able to do it, how they're going to do it, what's going to happen. You know what I mean? I think you're right though, because I mean, his goal is not to be like a great fighter. He wants to be the pirate King. So I, I mean, imagine that. I mean, how many fights has he gotten into that he would have needed to use these, right? Yeah, no kidding. Because it seems like through the beginning of this whole journey, he's only entering the most dangerous situations now than he ever has been. From what we understand anyways, right? Like we did, there was a big time jump, right? From when he was a kid to, um, I don't know their ages, but uh, I could only assume teenage years, right? Yeah, yeah, I believe they're teenagers at this point. And you're right, there's a, there's a nice big time jump between when we first see him as a kid interacting with Shanks all the way till now. But yeah, what would he what would he have had to like train in fighting for? There there really isn't anything that I can think of cuz from what I understand, at least from watching the anime, all those years were him actually we we don't even know what he was doing. No. Yeah. So it's Maybe we get that eventually, but um, 
yeah i don't know either way the gum gum stuff is is definitely amongst my favorite i've been enjoying that quite a bit yeah, it, it, absolutely i can't help but laugh though like that gum gum balloon like could you imagine if you saw that in like real life if there was a person you just met and all of a sudden, you know, shit's going down and his solution standing right next to you is to expand outwards and reflect whatever gets thrown at him. I I think we, I think you'd probably shit your pants. I'd shit my pants. For sure. But an- again, another, these devil fruits have cool abilities that I would love to have. You know what I mean? Like, it just would save your life in any situation, right? I mean, being a rubber dude, obviously it looks like he's impenetrable, in a sense. Like a, like a cannon being shot out of a freaking cannon. Or, sorry, a cannonball being shot out of a cannon. It didn't do anything. It just, it just bounced right off of him, right? And there's many instances where you do see how things like um like the big hammer getting hit on his head it didn't do any damage whatsoever it just bent his head and then just that that's it yeah just a little dent and you know, and what's weird is that it was a spiked it was a spiked malice or whatever right and so that didn't penetrate his skin at all so can he not be harmed by sharp objects then how do you defeat a rubber man and What's it going to take? You know, like, yeah, well, how this is the thing, right? Is that, you know, we haven't quite experienced what it takes to f- take down Luffy. And we're early in the game, but it does bring up the questions on what can hurt Luffy. I mean, when you think of it like a rubber band, fire. <laughs> yeah, you think fire for sure. Right. I mean, they did mention in the first arc that, uh, that there is, or at least they kind of hinted towards the idea that there's a devil fruit out there that is linked to fire in some regard, but we just haven't got that far yet. No, for sure. And again, like I said, we're early in the game, so who knows, maybe it's not objects that can take down Luffy, but maybe a certain devil fruit power can take Mm -hmm. down Luffy. Well, and we also know that Luffy can drown, which seems to be the theme of every devil fruit is that uh, it just takes your inability to swim. Which is really, it puts you at a disadvantage if you're out at sea all the time. Let's be honest. It's a big disadvantage, especially if you're a pirate. But, you know, here's the question. Could he not use a gum gum balloon and just float on the water? I mean, he, we could. <laughs> but I guess that would just be too easy. <laughs> I mean that makes sense. Like if I if I was if I was Luffy and I knew I was falling into the water, I would just gum gum balloon out and I would float on the surface of the water until someone either saved me or I figured out my shit. Like it almost seems yeah. like a, a a cheat, you know, a little hack. It's it's almost too simple. It, it might not work. I don't know. Yeah, I I don't know. Maybe down the road we do see that he can do that and. Maybe he can blow himself up big enough for them all to sit on his belly and he floats away with them. Who knows? Well, well, the other thing to think about is, well, they say that if you eat the devil fruit, that the sea actually hates you. So does that mean that if you fall into the water, it's not that you can't swim, that you that you are going to drown. It's that the sea pulls you down almost like a gravitational pull. Is that possible? Is that something that's happening? I don't know. I mean, that's what drowning looks like. well yes but what i mean is maybe if he even used the gum gum balloon rather than floating would he just sink straight to the bottom as a giant balloon man it's possible so then here's this begs the question if physics play a role in the one piece universe in any way if he balloons out that basically fills him with air right and so if he's out at sea, but the sea's pulling him down. So imagine he's going down, he's drowning, he's in the water, deeper and deeper. If he just lets all that air out like a balloon, wouldn't he just shoot right back up out of the water? He would. Off topic and off reference, but you mentioned it one time. When Ezra was facing Thrawn in the ship and the windows all broke, and they were 
light speeding through or skipping galaxies, however you want to say it, wouldn't they just die? Well, you would think that they would just die. Right. But we don't, we, we, we don't think about it. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a different world. But I mean, I'd be totally down with a one piece star Wars crossover. That would be cool. That would be pretty sweet. Not that would lie. be cool. But there's those little tiny details that they don't want you to ask those questions because they probably don't have the answers to them either. Yeah, no kidding. We need to that that's where like having like Oda Sensei or whatever on the phone and being like, yo, man, okay, so I got a question for you about Luffy. It's gonna be ridiculous, but if you could just like give me three minutes, it would be super helpful. I just have one question. Where is the physics involved with this? <laughs> <laughs> that's one of my favorite things about reading the manga, honestly. Like as as you read it and you finish a chapter he's got these little letters that people have written him and he actually responds with an answer. So, Oh really? Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty good. Like I, I thoroughly enjoy it, but I don't remember anybody asking that specific question. So if, if we could get some clarification on all this crazy balloon, um, sinking in the ocean theory, any, anything would help us out to be honest. For sure. I want to take a quick second and go back a little bit and talk about a side character because we were we had mentioned a couple side characters already, but I wanted to talk about Beast Tamer Moji and Richie the Lion. So we saw that their first interaction is really with Shushu while he's protecting the pet store. What are your thoughts on Moji? or Richie the lion they're kind of ridiculous characters if if you ask me the man with a cool animal suit which he claims is a man's hairstyle <laughs> I, I, i'm not buying the fact that that's his real hair not for one minute no not at all not at all i i actually really this probably one of my favorite parts as well is is when luffy says that and he's like that's a it's a cool animal suit you got there. And he's like, this is a manly haircut or hairstyle or something like that. And uh, I just thought it was funny. It was just a little humorous moment within such chaos, um, a chaotic scenario happening. And uh, I mean, I thought the character was kind of cool in a way. I mean, like he's, he's, he's a beast tamer. Um, he's got this big lion that uh, seemed to be well, I mean, look like a big force to be reckoned with, right? But, you know, Shushu and uh, and Luffy teamed up and took him down. Simple as that. But in the meantime, you know, it took down the pet store. No, was it was it the was it a cannonball or was it the beast tamer? Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I do remember the pet store got destroyed. Um, and they were able to save like one bag of pet food for Shushu. But to your point with, with, uh, Moji and Richie, I mean, here, here you got this guy coming up riding a lion, you know, you think, oh shit, it's about to go down. This must be a really tough, bad dude. And he's got the most ridiculous hair in the world. And rather than being intimidated by the lion, Luffy is like, you look weird. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like you're, you're a strange dude, man. <laughs> just yeah. cut some deep and, and just because of his response you know you, you know it totally rattled his confidence oh for sure he was pissed <laughs> yeah oh, fuck you <laughs> yeah 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 fuck you it's a manly haircut yeah well like we know anything about manly haircuts right yeah we're sitting here looking like we're fucking trying to bring back the cone heads well i mean i had hair and then i when i saw the the, the episode i tried to do the ear things um but it, it didn't work out so i just fully shaved it Ah, uh, well, you know, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, I didn't feel as manly. I thought you were just trying to make me more comfortable because I'm bald. Well, I mean, what better way to talk about One Piece than two bald men? <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I don't even know what that means either. What are you trying to say? I, I don't I don't know. Uh, yeah, neither do I. <laughs> so at the end, we saw that Nami got all the treasure and the map and everything from buggy's tent and uh lo and behold 
I mean, there was a misunderstanding when the villagers decided to, uh, they didn't like, well, one, they don't like pirates. And two, they thought that Luffy and Nami were the bad guys. So they chased them right off, <laughs> right off into the ocean. And uh, the best part, almost the best part was that Luffy left all the gold and treasure on the island or at least the orange town um it again intentions were proper by leaving all the gold and helping them because they needed it the most nami didn't like that at all <laughs> i don't think they left all the gold but they left quite a bit if i remember correctly i remember nami gave nami gives luffy the map to the grand line and um and i think it was like a sum of like 10 million berries maybe they did leave it all because they had to rebuild the entire town mm -hmm. you might be right actually now that now that i'm thinking about it but yeah i i just remember the money gets left behind or some money got left behind luffy gets the the grand line map from nami and nami temporarily decides to join uh luffy's crew for the time being, so we'll see how long that alliance lasts. I mean, we've seen the live action, so we kind of have an idea of, as to what's going to happen in the future. But um, either way, seeing it through the lens of the anime has been interesting because a lot of stuff is not the same as it is in the live action series. So there's lots of surprises for us around the corner. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And, it, you know, the townsfolk chasing after luffy nami and zoro was very reminiscent of the marines also getting rid of luffy and zoro at the end of romance dawn but also feeling a little grateful for their their actions yeah because you see the townsfolk they're just raging mad they want them out of there until the mayor come you know he wakes up and he's like no 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 these are good guys these are good guys yeah yeah no, and it, it kind of makes you think, is this going to be a reoccurring situation um, while building the crew? Are they going to be chased off of every island? And then, uh, again, you know, being chased off, but again, whoever's chasing them is grateful that they ran into them. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it seems so far, everybody that has run into the Straw Hat Pirates has left them in a better state they like or in a better way you know what i mean i think one of the things that i love about luffy and the straw hat pirate crew at this stage of the anime is that they really are whether it's their whether they're trying to do it or not they're really redefining what it looks like to be a pirate almost everybody they run into they think oh pirate this is bad and they are they're not bad. You know, they, they may be a little rough around the edges, but the, they usually have good intentions somewhere in there. Oh, for sure. It's like a little band of misfits. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, they look like a crew that's playing pirates, but they're also a force to be reckoned with and nobody expects it. Yeah, that's a good way to sum it up. And and honestly, I'm I'm wondering a little bit, like as we continue to go further into the anime, if that's a theme that we see, do they... When they leave everybody, like you said, are they going to be grateful that they had come across them? Or are they going to change their perception of how they view pirates? Or are they going to continuously follow the adventures of Luffy and the Straw Hat Pirates? Because we know there's, we know they have, they have some form of media. There's newspapers, bounty, wanted posters, etc. So I'm wondering, you know, like, are they going to be keeping tabs on their friend Luffy and the person that saved their village or what he's up to so it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out over the course of the series oh for sure absolutely i mean like the amount of detail that the anime goes through compared to the live action i'm sure we're going to see a lot more in-depth um interactions within uh everybody that luffy and the straw hat crew um, gets involved with is there anything else that you want to add just the uh we've seen the origins of you know at one point buggy talks about how he knew shank and how they've they used to be part of the same crew and this is kind of how their journey started 
it is cool information to learn that how good guy and bad guy used to be somewhat intertwined before they became big, you know what I mean? Before they became who they are right now. And you kind of get a glimpse of that with a little flashback. Yeah. And again, how Buggy starts to become a little bit more deviant when he gets selfish with this treasure map that they have that they both were supposed to go look for together and uh buggy takes it upon himself to get it himself and then uh, that's when he eats that uh devil's fruit in the manga he uh steals a devil fruit he steals the devil fruit and then he creates a decoy and he goes out in front of everybody on the ship and he eats the devil fruit but he's eating the decoy and so everybody's like oh no and so he's it's a facade right and then one night he's sitting and he's holding the real devil fruit and shanks comes up on him and it surprises buggy so buggy throws the devil fruit into his mouth to hide it right and shanks like gives him a good pal slap on the back or something i can't remember exactly but it makes it makes buggy eat the devil fruit and then shortly after he falls in the water and almost drowns right yeah now yeah i'm getting confused on because maybe it does it does show him falling into the water and uh, you know what i can't remember at which point but yeah and then uh shanks saves him so it does show you that uh buggy does fall in the water and he's drowning so at that point yeah he already took the the fruit and uh, he can't swim and then he he realizes it's something it, it did something to him yeah, but it, but uh, throughout that whole interaction, I really loved that they show almost like a closeness for a second between Shanks and Buggy because they're kind of like reminiscing and kind of talking about their futures and what they want to accomplish. And they're very clearly, they agree, they both have different aspirations. They both want to achieve, achieve different things, but they kind of bond over that for a minute, which I really like because it shows that Buggy's not He's not a bad guy. He just does bad things. No, for sure. Because it's going to move him forward towards his goal. And then as on the flip side, we have no idea what Shanks is up to. We have no idea. Yeah, no, it's almost like that uh, brotherly love at the moment. You know what I mean? Two two brothers on a crew, you know, but it's the it's the yin and yang, right? It's the It's the bad and good. And you've seen how even Shanks he knows how buggy is right he's, he's he's a little rough around the edges you know at that young age um but he still sh he still has compassion for him right he's his crewmate um he never had any ill intent towards him even throughout you know that last little moment of the selfishness of buggy you know what i mean and uh and again i think another reason why buggy kind of hates him because he's his complete opposite of buggy right it's just it's basically looking at himself in the mirror but like the good version right and yeah uh, it's kind of a cool little intertwinement between them both oh absolutely so jacobite we just spent a ton of time breaking down orange town talking about a lot of different things what would you scale it on a scale of one to five the ratings for me are hard because we're so early in the game it's very hard to rate it so low or rate it so high i know i gave the last arc a four because it was the beginning it was the introduction it was exciting uh this one i'd probably have to give it a four as well and i think that's even just being kind of gracious with it but i did just i really enjoyed a lot of the characters that were in this one it kind of set the mood for for what's to come as well and i think they all will except for this one was just there was something about buggy there was something about you know meeting nami for the first time uh like you said there was some interesting side characters in there that uh that really made it humorous but also when it came down to seriousness um I think there was a lot of aspects in this one. It was it was a feel good, but it was also an intense arc. So, 
I'm going to give it a four as well. No, that's a solid score. And honestly, I gave it a four out of five as well. I gave, I think, Romance Dawn a three out of five. So I upped it one point this time. And it, really, it came down to just all the different characters that we got introduced to. And I really, really loved, I loved Buggy. I loved meeting another character that had ate a double fruit went one-on-one -on -one with Luffy, really gave him an honest challenge. I loved that. And then on top of that, you know, I gotta, I, I gotta, I have to be honest. Part of the reason I'm scoring it higher than I did last time is because of Shushu. I fucking knew it. Shushu. I love the dog. Shushu could have made this whole story arc for me. I loved that fucking dog. He was awesome. Great character. Love the interactions between Shushu and Luffy. Uh, and then, of course, Shushu and Richie. So, yeah, giving it a solid four out of five. But I'm excited for us to continue this journey, man. Because next up, we got Syrup Village. Hell yeah. All right. Thanks for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed our breakdown of Orange Town and all the banter that came with it. Join us next time for Syrup Village. Make sure you hit that like and the subscribe to continue this journey with us. Take it easy.